First of all, I would like to say that we all are honored to be invited to present this paper on MIDEA at this workshop uh, celebrating Chris Mee. The site of MIDEA um, is situated at the eastern border um, of the Argive Plain and well known as a Mycenaean citadel. It has been excavated from 1983 to 2009 by a joint Greek-Swedish excavation program under the direction of Katie Dimakopoulou. But it was only in 2004 to 2006 when Katie excavated two adjacent trenches on the northwest terrace of the Upper Acropolis where stratified deposits with abundant concentrations of finds dating to late and final Neolithic Early Helladic 1 and 2, Early Helladic 3, Middle Helladic 1, as well as Middle Helladic 1, 2 and 3 material were found. In 2004, already the uppermost strata produced more Early Helladic pottery than has ever been found in any trench of the site. However, only from uh, 2005 onwards, several excavated contexts were not mixed with Mycenaean finds. For Early Helladic II, the most important finding was a space defined by the corner of two walls, probably a room. One of the walls was attached to a massive wall with a double megalithic face, possibly part of a fortification system. This space enclosed an assemblage of intact as well as large fragments of pottery vessels. During uh, 2005, in this area, two graves, a rock hut tomb and a pit grave, as well as a further context were found with, which shed light on an earlier use of the site. Furthermore, in 2006, when the excavations were extended to the west, this area brought to light a concentration of early Helladic I pottery, which was interpreted as an early Helladic I level. The aim of this paper is now to characterize this early pottery concerning its fabric and typology and to draw implications on its technology, use and distribution seen in the Neolithic and Early Helladic I pottery. The part on topology and macroscopic distinction of fabrics will be presented by myself and will be followed by a part on the petrography of the ceramic material by Claire Burke. Also, only a small proportion of the material comes from closed contexts. All significant shirts have been recorded to show the range of shapes and fabrics used at the site. All in all, out of about 3,000 selected shirts dating to the late Neolithic to early Helladic II, about two-thirds date to early Helladic II. Of the rest, nearly two-thirds are late Neolithic and final Neolithic, and just a third early Helladic I. For the final Neolithic material, there is one closed context, the pit grave uh, with a skeleton. According to the analysis of Michael Schulz, it is a woman of 40 to 50 years buried in contracted position. According to its C14 date, it dates calibrated uh, 4,320 to 4,270, which is the start of the final Neolithic at the Franchti cave, therefore dates to the earliest final Neolithic. Two red burnished shirts were found on the floor of the grave. One, the body of a pithoid jar with plastic decoration, reminding me of the previous lecture. Uh, the other, uh, the base of a jar, and both were sampled petrographically. This grave was set into an area containing a fill of highly fragmented material. The material has to be synchronous or earlier than the grave, and according to the published material, should be dated to the late Neolithic period, with a possible admixture of final Neolithic material. For the primary use of the context, the comparably high number of fine wares, mainly consisting of bowls, is remarkable. In this closed context, the late Neolithic fine wares show a comparably high number of pattern painted wares, 
which is also seen in the entire material. Aside them, a certain percentage of gray, a large amount of burnished and pattern burnished pottery, as well as one shirt with fine incised decoration were present. The polychrome and bichrome pattern pa uh, painted ware, which has its climax in the later phase of the late uh, Neolithic period. The paint is characterized by red and dark brown decoration, the dark brown surrounding uh, the red paint on a buff or orange surface. Characteristic decoration are vertical diagonal lines often combined with bordering wavy lines, but also triangles and meandroid design. These characteristic patterns are well known in the northeastern Peloponnese and show that Medea must have been part of a network of interaction, including the sites of Gonya and Lerna. The main shape of these fine wares are hemispheric bowls, so that we can argue that these wares were mainly used for the production of vessels for eating and drinking, and show the importance of dining at Medea during the late Neolithic period. The polychrome and bichrome wares are characterized by two kinds of macroscopic fabrics, one very fine gray or pink, with nearly no inclusions visible by the naked eye, the other gray or pink with small red inclusions. If we compare these polychrome fabrics with the fabrics of the most probably synchronous burnished and pattern burnished wares, we see that these fine wares use the same fabric. In contrast, the fabrics of the coarse, most uh, often pithoid vessels from the context around the grave too were macroscopically comparable to the typical final Neolithic fabrics, which I will discuss later. Therefore, it seems that late Neolithic fine pottery was produced with a recipe different to the coarse wares. In general, final Neolithic pottery is frequent in all contexts and has to be identified with the help of analogies from other sites. That there was most probably an earlier final Neolithic settlement synchronous with the grave is proven by the existence of the fine incised ware and crusted ware, which is also present in the earlier final Neolithic of the Franchti cave. However, there are also examples of heavy burnished ware, some of them with rolled rim, which indicate a settlement also during the later phases of the final Neolithic period. One of them is a rolled rim bowl of an extraordinary uh, red fabric and a brownish red, highly burnished surface, which Claire Burke will comment later. The final Neolithic pottery assemblage uh, burnished and coarse wares are dominating. The characteristic fabric of this pottery is low fired with red or black fractures which make macroscopically red, gray and white inclusions not easily visible. And as you will see later is characterized by a large amount of grog. Claire will comment on this extensively analyzed fabric later. For now, I would like to show its frequency according to my macroscopic view in the final Neolithic decorated fine wares. Fine incised ware, as it is known from Prosimna, is present in the Medea material with uh, 22 pieces only. All of them come from deep bowls and are characterized by fine linear zigzag or triangular incisions under the rim on a smooth or burnished, burnished surface. The uniformity of forms and the similarity of decoration patterns points to a special production of these bowls for dining. Most of them are made of fabrics comparable with the typical final Neolithic fabric already shown above. However, five of them belong to the gray fine and the pink fine fabric with red inclusions, known as typically late Neolithic fine wear. Therefore, it seems that there is some sort of overlapping of use with certain late Neolithic fabrics. The other characteristic final Neolithic uh, decorated fine wear is the crusted wear. 
It is characterized by broad bands of white crusted paint under the rim on a wiped or slightly burnished surface. And all of them belong to hemispherical or deep bowls. Again, three of them look macroscopically comparable to the late Neolithic fabrics. Finally, I would like to give some comments on the so-called cheese pots from Medea. These are bowls with a row of perforations under the rim, which appear already around the start of the fifth millennium BC and have their climax throughout the Aegean during the fourth millennium BC. In general, they were made of the low-fired, medium-fine to coarse fabrics typical for the final Neolithic period, with more white inclusions visible in the coarser examples of the pens. Interesting is the variety of forms in the material of Medea. Comparable to other sites, where they vary from deep and hemispherical bowls to deep bucket-like vessels, storage jars, pans, and asymmetrical vessels. They even can be decorated with incisions or have a rolled rim. In general, pans have their exterior unfinished and their interior smoothed. However, bowls quite often have a burnished surface. Therefore, I think the holes under the rim should not be interpreted as a typolog typological, but as a functional feature common to all these ty uh, types of vessels. And I would suggest that they were actually used to sew a cover of cloth or animal hide on them to protect their contents. The second area with a closed context is a level in the area excavated in 2006, which contained a site much late Neolithic and uh, final Neolithic material, some 34 early Hellenic one fragments. The grade of fragmentation of this early Hellenic one material is not as high as the one of the late Neolithic context, so that they probably come from a destruction layer. Together with material from mixed contexts attributable to early Hellenic I, all in all about 200 diagnostic shirts are present. Main forms are deep to medium bowls, fruit stands, fragments of flat bowls, ascoi, and jars, as well as one frying pan. Reference groups to these shapes mainly come from Tsungisa, Taliotti, and Vuliagmeni at the Gulf of Corinth. The most common early Hellenic one vessel shape is the bowl. The repertoire includes all shapes known from Tsungisa. Their surface is usually red painted and burnished, rarely unburnished, and very, unre very rarely unpainted. If we look at their fabric, a few have a pink fabric, the others are red, with a red fine, medium fine, and medium coarse texture. With the naked eye, I was able to recognize white, sparkling white, as well as a few red inclusions. However, the most characteristic shapes are the fruit stand, and related to it, the large shallow bowl, which was either part of a fruit stand or of a flat-based bowl. These bowls show a quite limited repertoire of shapes, However, they differ quite considerably in their size. They are either characterized by a rim turned downward or an outward turned rim with incised decoration on its interior, as they are known from the material from Taliotti and have analogies as far as Tsungisa near Nemea. Furthermore, the materi Medea material includes flat bowls with flattened or simple spreading rims as they are known aside Taliotti from Macrovuni Magula near Argos. Characteristically, most of them have a red painted, usually unburnished interior and quite often an unpainted, unfinished exterior surface. Of the pieces collected, most of them are of the fine grained fabric with white sparkling. Uh, white as well as fewer red inclusions and often show uh, a light gray core. 
In contrast, the medium and coarse fabrics showing a higher number of red inclusions are equally rare in both types of fruit stands or bowls with everted rims as well as the large spreading bowls. So these most probably specialized shapes seem to have been mainly produced in a certain fabric, which Claire will point out in the second part of the paper. Right, following on from Ava's typological and macroscopic summary, I'm going to focus on some of the petrographic and SEM results from Mathea. These results have been contextualized within wider research that examined over 700 samples of early Helladic ceramics from across Corinthia and the Argolid. As you can see from these images, the range of petrographic fabrics for the Neolithic at Mathea is limited and dominated by the practice of grog tempering, relating to some of the red inclusions that Ava noticed macroscopically. These grog fabrics are found in a variety of vessel types and wares, such as cheese pots and crusted ware bowls, and include the vessels sampled from the final Neolithic grave that Ava spoke about earlier. Further, although fragmentation meant that we were only able to sample one late Neolithic sherd, petrography confirmed Ava's observations about similarity between her late fine fine Neolithic fabric and her final fine Neolithic fabric. As you can see, both belong to similar grog fabrics that have a fine matrix, suggesting some degree of continuity of practice between both the late and final Neolithic periods. Whilst a high proportion of the Neolithic samples all share grog tempering, they also display diversity in terms of the character of the ground mass and the presence of a range of different raw material types, which include chert, limestone, sandstone, low-grade metamorphic rocks, mudstone, and rare fragments of igneous rocks, all of which can be sourced within 12 kilometers of Medea. The variability just described suggests the presence of a number of potters dominantly using local available raw materials for all who shared the practice of grog tempering, which appears to have been a very important element in Neolithic potting. Macroscopic and SEM analysis of the final Neolithic grog samples also suggests shared firing practices. Macroscopically, these vessels commonly display uneven surface colours with dark areas of localised reduction, suggesting firing in a mixed atmosphere and perhaps poorly controlled. In addition, the common presence of dark firing horizons and cores suggest a short firing time which prevented full oxidation of the ceramic. This evidence is consistent with open firing methods. SEM analysis also confirmed that many of these vessels were fired at low temperature ranges, indicated by lack of vitrification in the microstructure, suggestive of firing temperature ranges below 750 degrees. The use of grog continues from the Neolithic through to the early Helladic I period, where it has been identified in a jar. However, grog tempering seems to disappear after EH1 at Medea, suggesting a shift in technological behavior during the early stages of the Bronze Age. Aside from these grog-based fabrics, it's been possible to identify two other distinct Neolithic fabrics at Medea. Firstly, a fabric characterized by the presence of serpentinite rock fragments belonging to a high-quality rolled rim bowl that Ava mentioned earlier. Petrographically, the origin of this fabric is currently unclear. However, its unusual typological features suggest it may be an import. A second key Neolithic fabric is this sandstone to low-grade metamorphic fabric, identified in a range of shapes and which appears to have a very long history, which I will discuss a bit later in relation to the early Helladic period. Turning to early Helladic one, as you can see from this slide, early Helladic one is also characterized by a narrow range of fabrics, which may admittedly be partly due to the lack of availability of diagnostic early Helladic 1 sherds. 
The first fabric is characterised by serpentinite, chert, calcite and mudstone inclusions. These are consistent with the chert, sandstone, limestone outcrops four kilometres north of Medea. The second fabric is the sandstone to low-grade metamorphic fabric I just mentioned in relation to the Neolithic. This fabric dominates both early Helladic 1 and early Helladic 2 at Medea, supporting Ava's macroscopic observations that the early Helladic pottery was dominated by a characteristic pink or red macroscopic fabric with white sparkling inclusions and commonly with a grey core. It has been found at the majority of sites examined, being present from the final Neolithic at Medea in the Argolid, continuously through to early Helladic 3 at Sungitsu in Corinthia a widely distributed paste recipe in use for over 2,000 years. The nearest comparable source for the raw materials within this paste is a sandstone flysh containing ophiolitic bodies which forms the Taliote Valley four kilometres south of Medea. Significantly, we have identified important distribution trends that further support this provenance hypothesis. Firstly, this fabric is abundant in argolid assemblages that we have examined in a wide variety of vessel types and wares, from large courseware jars to fine tableware forms. And significantly, at the site of Taliote, located in the Taliote Valley itself, the entire sampled assemblage belongs to this fabric group, suggesting that this site was in close proximity to the production center. In contrast in the Corinthia, the fabric is associated with a very narrow range of vessel types, most dominantly the EH1 fruit stand form, but including deep bold ladles and small bowls, suggestive of a specific dining repertoire where food or drink was scooped or more likely dipped from the communal fruit stand and served into smaller individual bowls, a little like a modern punch bowl. Of the 38 fruit stands sampled from all the sites examined across Corinthia and the Argolid, 32 belong to this fabric group, indicating their origin from a specific centre of production. Further, as noted by Daniel Pullen at Sungitsa, the fruit stands at that site display a high number of repairs we have not noted on Argolid examples, suggesting that these vessels were a fundamental part of early Helladic one dining practices, but not perhaps easily replaced by Corinthian communities. SEM analysis has shown that both early Helladic 1 and early Helladic 2 vessels from this fabric were dominantly high fired, displaying features of extensive vitrification. The red orange colour of this low calcareous fabric would have been achieved in a dominantly oxygen rich atmosphere. However, the pr common presence of sharp firing cores is suggestive of fast firing techniques, and the uneven coloration of some vessels suggests localised areas of reduction indicative of poorly controlled firing conditions. To fully contextualise the development of pottery production and consumption at Medea and across the northeast Peloponnese more generally, it is important to briefly look at the early Helladic II period. In this period, Medea, like sites across the Aegean, has a more diverse range of vessel types and displays important trends in terms of the distribution of particular vessel types and fabrics. In particular, the fruit stand form appears to decline in popularity and instead we see the introduction of the source boat, its commonly elongated neck suggesting a new emphasis on pouring rather than scooping or dipping associated with the fruit stand. This accompanies the introduction of small saucers and bowls for consumption of a small quantity of food or drink and large jars possibly for transporting goods. This change in ceramic vessels is also accompanied by a wider variety of fabrics at Medea, as you can see in this slide, suggesting the community here consumed vessels from a larger number of producers compared to earlier periods. For the last part of this paper, I want to focus on two key fabrics which are suspected Corinthian imports and have important implications for the production and distribution of pottery during this time. The first is this argolite fabric, which has been found in abundance at the site of ancient Corinth and Karaku in relation to a range of forms, but most dominantly jars, but has only been found in a small number of examples at sites such as Medea and Tyrans in the Argolid, and most notably only in relation to jars. Whether it was the jars themselves or their contents that were the reason for the movement is unclear. The second suspected import is a characteristic fine clay mix. 
Like the sandstone to low-grade metamorphic group in relation to Taliote discussed earlier, it has been identified at the majority of the sites examined in this research and displays characteristic distribution trends. Firstly, it is consistently associated with early Helladic II black slip table wares. Most dominantly, source boats and saucers or small bowls. Significantly, it's most abundant in assemblages in the region of Corinth, and its abundance decreases with distance from that area. Secondly, we have found that while sites in Corinth and the Arglid share same tableware forms, such as source boats, those at Medea and other Arglid sites dominantly belong to the sandstone to low-grade metamorphic fabric from Taliote, commonly with a red, brown, or purple slip or surface color. This difference in vessel color not only relates to the type of raw materials, but also different firing practices belonging to each of the two centers of production. SEM analysis has shown that both the sandstone to low-grade metamorphic fabric and the green firing fabric were fired at high temperature ranges. However, whilst the sandstone fabric from Taliote would have been fired in a dominantly oxygen-rich atmosphere using poorly controlled firing techniques, the iron-rich slip on the highly calcareous Corinthian vessels would have required at least a two-stage firing technique of oxidation and then reduction to convert the iron-rich slip from red to black and produce a buff body, a lack of firing core suggesting full oxidation of the ceramic. Such a firing technique would have required control and manipulation of the firing environment, suggesting of a high degree of technical skill and understanding. This is particularly evident when examining attempts at black slips on vessels from the sandstone to low-grade metamorphic fabric, which can be thin and are often uneven in color. As you can see here, they stand in stark contrast <laughs> to the Corinthian examples. This suggests that the long-lived paste recipes and firing practices of the Taliote potters, dating back to the Neolithic, were not suited to the production of the fine, dark, slick buff vessels of the EH period. As such, the presence of the fine green firing fabric at Argolid sites may indicate consumption practices related to the quality of the dark slip finish achieved by Corinthian potters and certainly seems to indicate a regional difference in the production and consumption of slip table wares. To summarise today, we have presented some key results detailing significant trends in both technology and consumption choices at Medea. In particular, our polychrome ware suggests Medea was part of a network of interaction that included Corinthia and the Argolid. Cheese pots show a variety of vessel shapes and it is likely that the holes below the rim had a functional rather than decorative purpose connected with covering their contents of the vessel. We have identified a diachronic shift from grog tempering between the Neolithic and early Helladic period and clear evidence for the shared for shared technological practices and raw material choices. Finally, we have identified key areas of production within the Corinthia and the Argolid, with, long, with a long history of production and a wide distribution of specific vessels and tableware types related to EH1 and EH2 dining practices. The evidence from Mathea testifies to a transformation between the Neolithic and Early Helladic period and between Early Helladic I and Early Helladic II, not only in terms of production, but also the mobility of its pottery and patterns of consumption, with the movement of vessels in the Early Helladic being particularly related to shared dining practices in different regions. Thank you.